sentiment spikes here in America, then you can expect a spike of anti-American sentiment abroad. And now we, we see several counterterrorism uh, experts talking about how this is really undermining our efforts uh, throughout the world and putting more Americans in harm's way. Uh, and I think this issue of Islamophobia then has to be viewed as an American problem, not just as a Muslim problem. Now, Pew uh, has conducted a study that 70% of the American public has either an unfavorable view or no opinion on Islam. Uh, and here, I think the problem is, is that the extremists are able to tell their stories more effectively than the Muslim American community can tell its story. Because the Muslim American story still has not been told in terms of who we are, what we represent, how we want to contribute to American society. Yet, if some guy in some cave in a faraway place decides to make a video that curses America, that talks about bombing innocent lives uh, anywhere in any part of the world, if it's uh, bin Laden or, or somebody from a Shabaab in Somalia, if that tape is made, then within minutes, instantaneously, you get that video played over and over again in all US markets. Yet, if we as Muslim Americans, which we have done so many times, talking about our efforts, and we have a paper for you today called Building Bridges uh, in terms of partnership uh, in developing America's national security, we continue to do that work. We've had several condemnations of terrorism uh, throughout the years, even before 9-11. That story is still not told. But in the broader sense, and let me just end with two points, um, there is a problem between religious nationalism and religious pluralism. Religious nationalism, when a few, a small group of people, exploit religion using its popularity to serve selfish interests of a few and create violence anarchy, chaos, and they exploit religion, and religion becomes uh, something without justice. Religion without justice, then, is exploitation. They want God to serve them. They do not serve God. Religious pluralism, on the other hand, is that we have the belief in one God, and therefore, we believe in the one human family. And to believe in one God means that you have to support human equality. Whether people believe in God or don't believe in God, human equality is critical to the notion of the belief in one God. Therefore, God's will is one of racial and religious diversity. The Quran says, to each of you, we have made from among you different laws, and here the word sh sharia comes, shiratan, and different ways. And the Quran says, therefore, don't worry about your differences, just compete for doing good work. Um, and this diversity is very important for Muslims to understand as well as for us to explain to other people. And then very briefly in terms of Sharia, I know that Aziz al-Hibri, Professor Aziz, uh, Aziz al-Hibri will talk more extensively about that. Sharia simply means the, the road or the way or the path to God. Uh, it's, a, it's a general term. Uh, but one person made an important statement about Sharia. Uh, well known in Islamic history. His name is uh, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Juziyya, who is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, and he says, when there is no justice, there is no Sharia. So if we're talking about the Sharia of what we see in the Middle East, when there is bias against women, when there is oppression and violence uh, against the weak uh, and vulnerable communities, that is not Sharia to us, and that is not what we want here in America, definitely. We will be first to, to stand up in opposition to that kind of exploitation of Islam. And another great scholar says, where there is no security, there is no Islam. Where there is security, that is where Islam is. And therefore, America to us is the best place for Muslims, and we will work to preserve our constitutional rights for all Americans. Thank you very much. Good morning. I really didn't intend to stand before you and talk about Sharia law. That's uh, 
put a lot of you to sleep because I treat it as a very serious legal discipline. <laughs> I thought I will start today by making a few comments about American law and Muslims in the United States. And feel free to ask about any questions of concern to you about Sharia law. I am more than happy to answer those. But um, I got very much interested in the founding fathers uh, a, f a while back. And I went to Monticello and went to other places and looked in their papers and looked in the uh, Library of Congress letters and so on. And I found a lot of interesting stuff along the way, not only uh, as far as the uh, founding fathers, but the whole mood of the country in those days. And I was very surprised to find out, for example, that in, on the literary uh, level, um, there were plays written about attempts to liberate Muslim women who are oppressed in the East. You know, the, the talk about the harem and things like that. Uh, I found out that there were all sorts of suspicions expressed about Muslims. Um, I also found out, by the way, that there was an attempt at regime change by the United States in Tripoli, North Africa in the 18th century. Um, I found out that there were writings that Jefferson was aware of uh, which called Islam a false religion and the prophet an imposter. A lot of this had happened for a while. It didn't just happen yesterday. And I think it's time that we take a deep breath and talk to each other as co-citizens and ask ourselves, how are we going to relate to each other? And what's the foundation of this historical misunderstanding? I do not want us to uh, push anything under the rug. Let's have an honest and healthy discussion in a country which believes in uh, the process of law, in the, a country of laws and a country of due process. This is what protects all of us. It's not just about an Islamic minority or a Muslim minority. It's about all minorities, and it's also about the conscience of the majority. Another big shock that I developed as I was reading uh, the history of this country, I walked along up the campus of my university to the Historical Baptist Society, and lo and behold, I found out that their leaders in their own time suffered quite a bit. And in fact, this, they're not the only uh, group that have suffered, Jews, Catholics, and I can name a lot of other minorities that have had it difficult getting stabilized in this country. So I guess, you know, we all go through this. But hopefully, as we mature in terms of our understanding of our constitution, the process will become more dignified and, and less painful. So I want Muslims in this country to understand, in some way, they're not singled out. <laughs> Everybody else had to go through this one way or the other. The other thing is, and I'm talking to Muslims as well, is that, thankfully, the Founding Fathers had introduced, uh, through the insistence of a lot of religious groups who were Christian, uh, and atheist, by the way, and uh, uh, other religions, the First Amendment, which has its origin in the Bill of Rights of Virginia, and I'm happy to say that since I teach in Virginia, and I'm very proud of that fact. So, uh, what I'm asking for is a, double, is a double request. One is reassert our commitment to the First Amendment. Throughout history, it has shown that it is a very valuable part of what the U.S. is about. And in fact, I think this is one of the major attractions of the U.S. to immigrants who leave their countries. They love their countries and leave them because they truly believe that in this country they can have a f free and dignified b being that they have missed elsewhere. The Supreme Court throughout the years has again elaborated and emphasized the basic principles of the First Amendment. For example, in Lynch versus Donnelly, um, Chief uh, Justice Rehnquist emphasizes that political divisiveness, divisiveness alone, he stated, cannot serve to invalidate otherwise permissible conduct. So whatever we might feel about the person sitting next to us, they have rights. Even if we politically disagree, that's no reason to behave uh, in a way that would infringe on those rights. And furthermore, uh, the First Amendment uh, 
states, well, it doesn't state, but implies that the legislative powers of the government could reach actions only and not opinions. And so it's wonderful that we could all sit here, and I'm sure we, some of us will disagree on certain aspects of the discussion, but we are protected by the First Amendment in doing that. Um, One wonders uh, about the situation that has arisen recently with all sorts of broad misstatements and misinformation about Islam that Salam has referred to and I'm sure others will talk about later today. But I'd like to point out that that misinformation does not only come from non-Muslims, it also comes from Muslims. That many Muslims themselves are misinformed about their religion. And that I feel that a major part of my responsibility in this country is to educate Muslims about what the Quran really says. For example, since I'm a woman and I'm committed to women's issues and women's dignity and, liber and liberation, I, uh, we at my organization, Karama, run classes in which we teach Muslim women and hopefully in the future men about the rights that are guaranteed to them by their own religion. What is surprising about all this is that most of the women we teach are surprised that they have all these rights. So there is a stereotype, a very negative stereotype about Islam that goes around. And it goes around even within the Muslim community because they don't see it as negative. They have misinformation about Islam, but they don't understand that this holy book, this Quran, has basically the principles of the First Amendment in it that historically Muslim uh, communities have practiced religious tolerance. This is nothing new. It did not start with the United States. It started many hundred years ago. It might not be, have been as good, as perfect a practice as, and it's not so perfect yet in the United States, but certainly it was done, and it was done in a, in a historical era when nobody else practiced it. So when Islam was tolerant and uh, welcomed diversity and used it to develop societies as opposed to uh, fight progress. You know, if, if Islam did that, how come we forgot all these important uh, achievements and instead we went to an authoritarian structure, a patriarchal understanding, um, and an understanding that has caused a lot of uh, pain, not only uh, for us in this country, but elsewhere. My message today is that we really need a serious conversation about Islam. And by that, I also include the Muslims uh, in this country and elsewhere. We need a serious conversation, not based on the demagoguery of somebody or another telling us what they think Islam is, but on a serious study of the text of the Quran which shows, for example, that democracy is at the heart of Islam through the concept of shura, which is a consultative uh, uh, approach, through the uh, separation of powers, through the election of the head of state. None of this we see today uh, in, in Muslim countries, which is why I think Salam said that he feels this is a uh, most congenial country to be in for Muslims because it represents more of the principles of Islam that uh, we believe in. So if we are going to talk a little bit about Islamic law, I would mention one verse in the Quran which is paraphrased by Jefferson without reference to the Quran. So it could be that they just both, you know, that Jefferson thought of it on his own. Uh, but you all know that he, he did own a Quran, and I suppose if he owned it, he read it. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran which says, there is no compulsion in religion. That's the freedom of exercise, so that everybody is free to pick what they believe in. And he mentions that in his cyclopedia. The Quran also advocates what, what is referred to in the Quran as kalima, kalimat sawa, which is a fair word or equitable word with other religions. Communication. Even if somebody, the Quran says, talks to you or acts towards you in a way that is hostile, return the bad deed with a good one. So that ultimately, this person who is unhappy with you or hostile to you will one day become your friend. Because human beings, I would elaborate, are at, 
in the end, good people. And if they understand that you're not out there to hurt them, and you are friendly, then they'll come around and talk to you. I'd like to see a serious conversation started in this country. The word Sharia law has been banded around as a, a, a threat. I don't know where this came from. Uh, why, why is it being discussed in the United States as a threat? Um, maybe you can enlighten me during the Q&A and I'd be happy to answer. But American Muslims have been living under the American laws for ever since you know, they came to this country, which by the way is before the 1600s.